Hello, my name is Albert Liu, and I'm a local CrossFit coach. I run a CrossFit gym out of my house here in Boise. It's called Audacious CrossFit, and I have a specialty in teaching people how to run. And today, we're going to go over is the background of what this way of teaching and learning what running is, and it's specifically called Pose Method. And I got my good friend here, Jason, who is a local teacher and CrossFit coach, actually. Ed is a public charter high school in uh, Caldwell. Yep. And he's, we're just going to riff today on what this is all about. Um, Albert, so you came out to my class while I was on vacation with my family in Ireland. Ran Actually ran my class literally and figuratively <laughs> <laughs> through the pose method. Um, just talking, teaching them how to run, talking to them about um, how to run safely um, so you want to describe that process just a little bit for us? Sure. So Jason asked me to help sub for him for that week. And I literally ran these kids, his uh, weightlifting and his CrossFit kids, uh, through what post method is. It's a systematic way of teaching someone how to run or how to move, um, in relation to the laws of nature or gravity. So what I took the kids through was to teach him what, what mechanics was or what the description of what movement running is. Um, and then from there, we applied it in what technique was or technique or the how to do the thing or the run. And it's a it's a simple and elegant way of describing what running is. We, we've learned what the specific position, what a body needs to be in, in order to interact, interact with uh, nature or gravity properly. And then from there, do the least amount necessary to get the movement going or running going. And uh, yeah, to emphasize to them that they don't need to do that much in order to run to get the results they want. So it was four straight days. You had uh, about 45 minutes of instruction each class because you had uh, five minutes on, of changing on both ends of the class. But yeah, 45 minutes total times four, which was, uh, what is that, three hours total during the week of teaching them how to run and how to apply it and their sports they're, they're actually playing outside of CrossFit or weightlifting. Yeah, so I work with a lot of young athletes, and you know, I'm a basketball coach too, and so helping them transfer this to their sport, like you know how, how to how to run safe, how to how to uh, avoid injuries, overuse injuries, and things like that, mm -hmm. especially just with the you know, constant pounding, at least in, in basketball, up and down the court. Um, how, how do you get it to transfer from, like, training to to sport? Like, like how, would you, how would you go about doing that? So it would start with what we did in class was to develop their perception of what their body weight pressure is through their feet because when we're running, then uh, we're, we're on the ground. And uh, to develop their perceptions of their feet means uh, they're able to better adjust their technique on the fly if they end up perceiving like the wrong pressure, for example, uh, the different part of the feet. So with that, then once perception is developed, we could we could teach them these two concepts. Uh, these two concepts are called unweighing and taking advantage of what's called muscle tendon elasticity. And those two things actually help someone run or play their sport um, more effortlessly that they don't need to try to use their muscles anymore in order to move or to play the sport. So we just teach them basically from the from, from the, from the foundations of those things first before teaching them uh, straight line running. From there, then we, we talk about how to change directions and we, we change directions by falling in a direction we want to go. And so they would take those two concepts and better perception of what uh, body weight pressure is, and apply it in the change of direction drills. Uh, from there, if they're playing basketball, they're shooting and jumping all the time. So we apply those two those two same concepts to jumping and shooting as well. Can you talk a little more about like the unweighing? So you and I are yeah, we're doing coach speak right now. Yes, yes. Um, but you know, as a teacher and a coach, I know sometimes you got to like break these concepts down for kids in like more digestible ways. Um, mm -hmm. So how would you take, you know, those, those concepts that 
you know, we know really well and, and help a kid really understand what it is that we're, you know, we're looking for. Like, what do we want to see, you know, from them? So. Gotcha. So what I would do with the kids is take them back to little basic physics. So knowing that us as humans on this earth exist because of this thing called gravity, that when we're on the ground, we're being pulled to the center of earth by gravity. That means we're balanced on support and we have a certain body weight at that point. If we're not on the ground, then we are in the air and we do not have any weight or any body weight. So that means we're weightless. So the point is when we're moving is to remove our body weight from the ground or support. And we, we do that by unweighing. Now the, the application of this in movement and coaching or having a kid do this is we're trying to take the least loaded part of our bodies which are shoulders and arms and head and removing it from the ground. So we're going to take our shoulders and literally shrug up and arms rise up above our heads in order to pull the rest of our body away from the ground. Uh, a good analogy is we're going to tell the kid to imagine that they're a slinky and we're going to take the top of part of a slinky and pull it away from the rest of the slinky. And as, at some point when we pull hard enough or tall enough or high enough, the rest of the slinky will follow. And that's what we're trying to do when we're unweighing ourselves. You mentioned like jumping, you know, so I know in CrossFit, we, we do a lot of plyometrics and things like that. Also as a basketball coach, you know, teaching proper jump mechanics, you know, for, for that sport in particular, what, how do you, so I, I like the concept of the slinky, mm -hmm. Um, I'm sure that that applies to jumping as well, jump mechanics. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about that? As far as it pertains to running, so we're going to teach someone to get to the specific body position or running pose. Okay. And then we're going to fall from support and then pull our feet from the ground. That applies to jumping as well. So we're going to put ourselves in the optimal position in order to respond or to interact with that gravity or that nature. So you want to put ourselves in a in a hinge position, like a the bottom of a kettlebell swing, for example. We're going to load our hips and hammies, and then we're going to unweigh using our shoulders and arms to get hip extension, and then to get in the air. Um, so for, as far as that goes, then yeah, we're going from that pose of the hinge to the pose of essentially in the air and landing back on the ground in that same hinge position again. Um, and then as far as uh, reacting or responding with the ground when we finally get on the ground uh, in order to continue that movement and not stop movement and to continue jumping we can take advantage of that muscle tendon elasticity that uh, exists in our, in our bodies so that springiness or that recall action happens in our muscle and tendons if we're interacting with the ground quickly okay yeah so i know you talk a lot about the pool when you're running mm -hmm. and that that order of muscle activation is is super important, mm -hmm. you know. And lately, I've been seeing things, um, even in relationship to jumping, where people are really working like their anterior tibialis, you know, tib raises, mm -hmm. those kind of things. And mm -hmm. and it, there seems to be an emphasis on those pulling muscles, and and not just because the other muscles aren't working, but just just the order in which they come online mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, so we maybe want to talk about that a little bit. I think what I would like to go back to is Newton's laws of motion. So Newton's got three laws of motion. And the first law of motion states that uh, an object stays at rest or is it an object at rest stays at rest or uh, an object in motion stays in motion unless an uh, unbalanced or external force acts upon it. And what we need to look at is the, the different actions and movements we're taking in our lives and sports. They're actions we take in order to um, get some type of result we want. And we need to really consider is these, these forces that we're using shouldn't be focused on the internal forces or muscles. We should be acting based on these external forces or gravity. Okay. So when we're cueing someone as a coach is we need to have them think, do that action, jump, right? Or to throw or 
you know, do a clean or something, right? We're, we're telling them, tell them to do the action and let the muscles respond accordingly to the demand that they're putting the bodies under. Now, we're talking about running then. It's the pull action that we're cueing someone to do. We're just trying to tell them to break contact with the ground. So as soon as that foot comes to the ground, we're thinking immediately get it up off the ground again. And the muscles that are causing that to happen are just those. Those pulling muscles, yeah. Um, for a lot of people who are ignorant or haven't been trained this way yet, they're going to feel their hamstrings work a little more than before. Makes sense. So it sounds to me like I've been looking a lot into like constraints-based coaching, mm. especially when you're cueing your athletes to do certain things. Really, like... You're putting them in an environment where you're, you're teaching them to interact with their environment. Because in sport, mm -hmm. the environment is constantly changing. Yes. I mean, we're throwing lots of variables in there, and they have to be able to respond to those those variables, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it sounds like this is a little bit like constraints-based approach. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, do you want to talk about that a little bit, or is it is that mm -hmm. it, have we... Is that kind of off topic? I don't think I don't think we veered <laughs> off the tracks too much. Okay, okay. I was I would consider it as you're imparting some scenarios on the kid or the athlete, and then having them um, play in that game of that scenario and respond accordingly to what you want them to do. Right now, it's yes, giving them the the concept of the standard of what movement is, knowing that you need to get to the certain body position. They need to shift their body, their center of mass in a direction the way they want to go and then change support. So they change support by essentially pulling their feet off the ground. So in that specific scenario or drill or play, having them apply that technique to in the middle of this, the sport skill they're trying to apply. So if we have some type of um, baseline training of knowing what body position, what uh, shifting that, that mass is and what chain support is as a baseline, they can, if they have it automatic, then they can also, also um, automatically apply into their, um, the sport of choice. Okay. Well, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. So just having that, that baseline concept introduced and in training, right? To, yes. To where it becomes automatic. Yes. So that when you cue it in the sport, like you can give them just, just one word and they and then they fall back to their training or the level of their training yes at that point and okay. you're, you're conditioning them through all those drills and scenarios you're playing them through in that constrained training yeah i like that because it's in the sport it's like figure it out but they have to have the proper tools going into that in order to figure it out and mm -hmm. come to solutions movement-based solutions mm -hmm. um we're also very interested in mechanics from an intensity with what we do um, at the same time, making sure that our athletes stay healthy, yes. injury free. So you want to talk about how like pose method in particular um, prevents a lot of those overuse injuries and things that, you know, can creep up in, in our world. Yeah, sure. So what pose method is, uh, the, the systematic way of teaching someone how to move or run, is we're teaching them how to properly interact with nature or the environment with their bodies. And the vast majority of the pain and injuries that we're seeing today in uh, normal folk <laughs> who, run, who voluntarily run all the time, uh, the stat is about eight, to, 8 out of 10 in people every year who do run get hurt in some way. And that stems from this uh, ignorance or the not knowing of what how to move, how to run. It could be that when they were growing up as kids, playing other sports growing up, is that they were maybe given cues and commands, instructions that were a little off base. So some specific cues that you might know of um, are high knees, um, butt kicks, A skips, B skips, C skips, reaching their feet out in front of them to try to grab the ground and pull themselves over that foot. Those cues and commands are operating from that, what we call a paradigm of, of um, a muscle-centric way of looking at things. 
thinking that muscles propel them or get them to move in the direction they want to go. And that's basically in violation of the, of the first law of motion then, that these muscles are internal forces and they're basing all these cues and commands off um, just flawed logic, essentially. So if someone's striding out, reaching for the ground in front of them, they're going to make contact um, with their foot in front of their body. And that causes uh, more loading of the joints, muscles, and tissues than we need. They're spending more time on the ground because they're putting their foot down in front of them. So the, the term you use just now of overuse is actually a misuse injury or pain. That these uh, joints, muscles, tendons, they're meant to take instantaneous eccentric efforts. And uh, because we're loading too long, that means our eccentric uh, phase of that loading or that, that movement is too much. It's greater than we need. And then those, those tissues are doing more than need. On top of that, once someone uh, arrives to that balance position, whatever that body position is, in, position is, where their center of mass is directly over the point of support, meaning their feet, once they're balanced, then they need to start moving in the direction where they go. So they start shifting their center of mass that way. From there, if they're considering pushing off, driving, exploding to get them where they want to go, they're actually doing more than they need on that concentric motion as well, a concentric phase of that movement. Because if we're operating with elasticity, it's a automatic load unload, like a spring. So when they start moving and driving and pushing, they're actually doing more than need as well. So their hamstrings, calves, feet, bottoms of feet, they all get uh, overworked as well or misused as well. So those uh, movement, non-contact injuries can be uh, prevented just by learning how to post fall pull. And in an application, whether sport they're in. So that that makes me think a little bit when we talk about eccentric, concentric, isometric mm -hmm. movements. Um, like we may want to specifically train like those like kind of triphasic yep. type training. Yep. But in sport, you know, where we're we're not looking to like necessarily emphasize one of those contractions over another mm -hmm. is that kind of what you're saying because too much time you know with that repetitive use mm -hmm. is going to lead to you know not necessarily a training effect but like you know um it's going to decrease performance overall is that you'll, you'll decrease performance as well as incur higher risk of pain and injury okay. if you're quote unquote, trying too hard. Yeah. Now, the, so in training, when you're doing eccentric uh, training or concentric or isometric, triphasic, right? What you, you're doing that to prepare the, the joints, the bones, the tissues, right? Um, for the actual loads they're going to experience. And then when it finally comes to com competition or sport or the event, you just got to let them play, right? Let them do the movement. Let them take the action the eccentric, concentric, isometric parts of that movement they're doing in that, in that competition, their game, will happen na naturally as a result. What we're trying to get them to do is just, again, not try to do, uh, exert effort on the eccentrics or concentrics or the holding an isometric too long. We're trying to get them to redirect movement and not stop movement. That's huge when you talk about like agility and you t and and those things that are necessary for sport or to be successful at the sport, um, making it like look easy. Mm -hmm. Cause if you think of some of the best athletes in their sport, they don't look like it's hard. For, they, they, they make it look easy. Right. Right. And so the training, if I'm understanding right, the training that you're talking about, um, outside of the sport is all centered around making movement look simple not more complex. Yes, the <laughs> to to make a movement more look more effortless, right? We're con we're talking about the description or the mechanics of the movement. We want to make them as fluid, as effortless, as light, right, as possible. But in our, in our coaching respect or point of view, we're trying to break it down to more simple and elegant ways of instruction, right? For them to finally put it all together and flow. Um if we're going to look at 
call it Usain Bolt, right? The fastest mm-hmm. guy in the world. He makes he makes it look so easy and effortless. And for the the best result we have in the world right now, right? His world record 100 meter run. He's able to do that because he's innately connected or able to interact with our nature in the highest way possible, the best way possible. He can completely surrender to this force of gravity to a system in his running. And him, he's just along for the ride. And his body's just responding accordingly to how much he's interacting with that gravity, essentially. So we, the more we can get a student or athlete to do that, the better results they're going to get, the less pain and injury they're going to experience. And not having them, again, try. <laughs> so this might be a little bit off topic, but I don't, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Uh, f- like free play. So like probably when you and I were kids, there was a lot more free, unstructured play. Yes. Interacting with the environment, yes. uneven surfaces, a lot of barefoot. Yes. You know, mom had to tell us to go put, put your shoes, shoes on, those kind of things. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think that the more structured environment and the lack of free play for whatever, like whatever reasons, fear, whatever it is, mm-hmm. um, is contributing to them ha- struggling to recapture this, this natural movement? What would what would be considered natural movement, natural running, jumping, things like that. Yeah. I and mean, we just jump out of trees off of over fences, like, you know, th- those kind of things. And it was, nobody was teaching mm-hmm. us how to do that. Mm-hmm. I think that when you mentioned the cueing from the coaches, whether it be in the sport or, you know, so-called specialists that aren't, aren't specialists at all. They're, they're just cueing kids to do things the way they were cued. And yeah. is almost an unlearning. Yes. Of, of, of this is yes. that yeah okay. It's very correct. <laughs> okay, good. So let's. let's I don't want to re- be incorrect. So you're you're always. But you can correct me. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, rewind all the way back to when we were cavemen. So when we were cavemen around in the what's called North American plains here. Yeah, I still am one in some regards. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Beard culture. <it. laughs> no. Uh, when we were living and trying to survive in this environment, if we couldn't move well or specifically run well, what would happen to us? Die. <laughs> yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't do what we want to do and live and pass on our genes, right? Yeah. Now, if someone were to run well, be move well, they'd get the results they want. Get that animal, um, beat that person, um, get away from danger. And then those people who did that well, though their genes, right, and their... <laughs> their their culture was selected for. They progressed through the ages. And with modern society now, the necessity to move well and run well is not a survival mechanism anymore. Mm-hmm. So we don't need to do all those cool things we can do our bodies that well anymore. And that's reinforced by maybe some of these things today that the um, accessibility of getting food getting transportation, uh, the play, the play we're doing today. Most kids are playing on those devices now. Mm-hmm. They're not out and about on these playgrounds are that were <laughs> yeah. maybe a little more uh, harsh to us back then. Take away monkey bars. The, they're playing on soft surfaces now. Um, the slides don't burn us anymore. They don't have those <laughs> anymore, right? Uh, so we were, as kids, learning how to move in accordance with the laws of nature. We were punished if we violated the laws of nature. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so Dr. Romanov, the guy who um, discovered and developed Poe's method, he he brings his uh, Chinese philosopher's quote up all the time. So pain is the penalty for violating the principles of nature. So we as kids were doing that all the time, playing around, free play. Yeah. The kids today and the generations today, they're having very few free play time and they're told to go into this specific sport prep program at this specific, you know, facility yeah and they're immediately specializing mm. right off the bat and that's not what we should be doing right uh what dr Roman and I have said is that back then in soviet union or russia they would have these gpp programs to prepare kids for ultimately whatever sport they want to go into so when they were brought to these sports schools or universities they would learn a academic curriculum 
they would learn in addition to that just sport education or just general physical preparedness like we are doing CrossFit all the time. Yeah. So they did CrossFit back then as kids, essentially, <laughs> and prepared them for the higher levels of applied sport, right? Hmm. That's what they did. And that's what we should be doing here, but our culture has um, not emphasized that. Yeah, you're hitting on a hot topic issue for me because <laughs> I have kids all the time that are, you know, well, I'm, I'm a, you know, a soccer player. I'm a baseball player. I'm like, no, like you should be looking at it first as you're an athlete. Yes. You know, I don't remember what the study was, but it, it, I think it was Ohio State's football team, mm -hmm. like something like 90 percent. And I'm going to misquote this so people can go look, can look me you. up. And yeah, <laughs> um, were multi-sport athletes. And in, in fact, they were looking for that mm -hmm. because they knew like whatever system they put them in, they were adaptable. Yes. And they were going to be more successful overall. And you're right. It seems like here we're doing the reverse. We're like, oh, no, you got to play soccer 24 7, 12 months out of the year. Mm -hmm. And I love soccer. I think it's a great sport. Of course. I think kids need to take a break and do something different. <laughs> yeah. Um, for a lot of reasons, not just physical reasons. So, of course. yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, so, so you mentioned, you know, the Russians were doing GPP back in the day, mm -hmm. you know, before. CrossFit trademarked it. Yeah. Um, so how, how does like Pose Method fit into that concept of general physical preparedness? Because that's a, that's a hot, you know, topic for us as CrossFit coaches. We're, right. We're always looking for that. So I would say going back to what Pose Method is, right? Teaching movements via teaching them via um, a bunch of poses. So we're, we're changing from pose to pose to pose and whatever movement we're doing. And we teach them in starting with a certain key pose. For example, we're teaching someone a deadlift. And what's the starting position of a deadlift? Yeah. Whatever that is, right? Yeah. And then from there, we we on way, and then we change the we essentially kind of change we change poses. We stand up with the weight, and we achieve that final pose essentially, right? And if we can teach all our movements, especially in CrossFit, that way, we're looking at the lens of pose to pose to pose and knowing where our center of mass or interaction interaction of gravity is that way it changes the game completely yeah uh, for example i the one change i felt when after learning this was just wall ball shots so i'm trying to unweigh myself from the ground as i'm coming out of the bottom of that wall ball shot to throw the ball up so i'm unweighing using this and then finally arms follow over the ball going up to the target yeah and that made it even more easy for me so if we can have someone consider that way now in cueing and the movement, then they might be able to do a little more, a few more ball ball shots in a row as compared to before. That night they might, their stamina might be a little more increased because of that, for example. Uh, rowing too. Mm -hmm. When you're on a rower and starting position in rowing, when you start driving out, right, we're con we're maybe consider falling backwards away from that platform with your feet on instead of driving off with your muscles so hard. So oh, that all applies, getting our center mass moving in the direction we want to go. Hmm. So again, post method is just transcends running. It's not just uh, running. It's all movement because yeah. we're looking at when a body's on the ground to when it's in the air. I'm just trying to figure out how well we can get into the air and stay in the air as long as you can, essentially. Well, I think that that would make sense to coaches who emphasize uh, movement patterns over exercises. So, for instance, we mentioned the deadlift. Mm -hmm. I have kids that come in like, "When are we deadlifting?" I'm like, "Do you mean when? When are we going to hinge mm -hmm. again?" Or, you know, I talk to them about the exercise is less important than the the movement pattern yes. that we're trying to train. Like, you know, I can make you stronger at a bench press without bench pressing. You know, all the time. And mm -hmm. and so, um, and then you mentioned the um, the wall ball shot that made me think of even like you and I have worked a little bit in Olympic weightlifting. Mm -hmm. I don't think we took a level two together, or level one, something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, from a coach here is great. Mm -hmm. And think about that kind of falling underneath the, the barbell, mm -hmm. and, you know, on, on the catch mm -hmm. in order for that to happen, you got to disconnect from the ground mm -hmm. a little bit. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I, I totally get that. That's yeah. that's awesome. So, 
Um, and I'll have some other questions here, like, uh, mm -hmm. like who, who are you looking to help, you know, outside of the people who come in and out of your gym or helping out a friend? Like, I mean, where do you see, um, venturing out with, with this methodology? So I would remind back to 2017 when I moved up here that, uh, when I came up, I knew I wasn't the, I was the only, uh, certified post method running technique specialist out here. And I was going to cover out my niche that I was going to help out as many communities as I can around here, uh, with their movement slash or under that running that nobody was teaching it this way. And I was going to reach out to, I did reach out to a lot of PTs, a lot of Kairos, sport coaches, CrossFit gyms, other gyms, running shoe stores, running clubs to say, hey, let me, I have this specialty and let me help you personally first, these individuals, but also your patients and clients out that we can greatly improve their performances as well as reduce their chances of pain and injury based on just giving an idea of what, what the standard is of what movement is, what running is. And I've reached into all kinds of worlds now, all kinds of communities. And I think the next iteration is try to really let this take foothold and how our high school coaches are applying this and whatever sports they're, they're t uh, coaching. So it'll be the media application, I think, is cross country and track because mm -hmm. that's where running is specifically. They're going to be the most open to it. I think so. Yeah. From there, then other sports that have if run, have any kind of running in it, any of the ball sports, for example. Um, from there, then if that's the high school level, good. We're handling that. Once they get to the college level, if they get there and into their adult lives, they can use it for the rest of life. But from there, we can go down even deeper or earlier. So if we can get to running clubs at local elementary and middle schools, for example, I'm going to call you guys out. Uh, <laughs> girls on the run or soul kids, people like that, groups yeah. like that. We can inject some type of knowledge like this into the kids then to set them up for middle, high school, college that they don't need to be taught at high school level then. right? If they have any modicum of this kind of knowledge at the very beginning, then the transition to when they get to me, for example, at Compass, when I'm coaching cross country, the reinforcement, the basics don't need to be there as much then, for example. Right. That they, they don't need to catch up. That makes sense. What strategy do you have? So you don't have to sell me. Yeah, sure. Because, of course. I mean, I do coach sports, but I, you know, I'm also, you know, strength and conditioning coach, CrossFit coach. So I, mm -hmm. I understand this. I see the value in it. Um, I do know that, like, certain sports coaches are, they're, they're resistant to, any kind of change, right? And and they know their sport, mm -hmm. but they don't necessarily know movement. Yes, like you know movement. Right. So, um, how do you approach those coaches in order to overcome that? That you know, really, uh, not a. It's not a growth mindset. It's mm -hmm. a. It's a fixed mindset. Right. Like, how do you overcome that fixed mindset with those coaches? I would just say, if I get any kind of opportunity to do a short presentation or just talk to any of the staffs or coaches around and show them results right yeah. off the bat. So I can show them results from the four classes I taught with you mm -hmm. or the hundreds of people I've um, shown, I, I've helped throughout the years and shown them all the videos, the before and afters I have on my iPad here. And from there, it's if they're really open to it, I can take them personally, the cat coach, through a whole experience of what this movement and running should be. And get them to experience how effortless it can be, that their muscles aren't working too hard, that's immediate sell, right? Right. That the stat I give that has been measured is uh, about 20% less oxygen is consumed if they're moving properly. As well as uh, half the load is taken out of the knees when they're moving properly as well. We teach them to post fall pull, those two things happen. And if we can deliver that stat to one of these coaches out there, knowing what the application is to their team and what kind of results they can get from that, I think that should be it. <laughs> so that oxygen um, topic is super interesting mm. to me too. Um, I would imagine 
you know, with the the less oxygen being consumed, there's a direct correlation to keeping that heart rate lower, right? And I, I actually, I just read this yesterday. You and I were talking about a book I'm reading. Yes. And uh, the guy specifically mentioned some research that once the heart rate gets to a certain level, performance drops. Mm-hmm. Um, and so maintaining that, you know, lower heart rate, and obviously there's some cardiovascular conditioning, but then, um, keeping that heart rate low as it, cause coaches care about performance. Of course. So if you can show them a direct correlation between how this is going to help them win, mm-hmm. then obviously they're in, they're in, <laughs> I mean, they, we can talk all we want about how, you know, winning's not the most important thing and it's not, but it's still important it is. to coaches. And so uh, let me expand on the breathing part of it and the heart rate thing. That'd be great. So if someone considers their movement or their running right as a skill, they're going to look at the fundamentals of it or the basics of it first, right? So we break it down to what technique is, uh, pose, fall, and pull. If those three things can be executed well from, let's, ca- let's say, one step to the other, just in one step, one pull, arriving that pose accurately and precisely, then they've earned the ability to take yet another step or another pull. So we're, we're breaking it down from one step to the other. And they can do two steps well. Let's try three. Let's get, can they execute that well for three steps? And it should be a long, uh, long view at it, a long-term process to this, that they're earning their speed and distance and the results they want over time. And it should be a high value, high skill, high approach to all this. Because they're improving their skill, their technique, then the physiology is just, or just will be improved as a correlate. So heart rate, all those things, right, will be lower, yes. Their CO2 tolerance will be better, yes. Their um, oxygen consumption will be less because they're trying to use less muscles now or fewer muscles now to try to propel themselves. And as a, as a result, then their interaction with the environment is better. So they're again uh, the loading their experience is way less. So if we can again take it as a skill based process, and then finally applying to their sport in a patient process, patient way. If we look at now how GPP is, if we're teaching a kid from toddler age GPP and how to interact with the environment properly from, from then on, then the 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 amount of well, the level of results they want is infinite at that point. By the time they get to you at, in high school playing basketball, that's what they want. Yeah. So this really needs to happen down, you know, even at the elementary PE level, that yes. physical education, um, <laughs> uh, CrossFit kids, Essentially. so to speak. Uh, on, the, on the oxygen side of things, yes. I mean, do you ever use constraints – because we talked about a constraints-based approach, mm-hmm. like um, like mouth taping or teaching them to, you and I have talked about shift yes. breathing, yes. and so I think that in order to get them to relax and and to make it easier, there is like optimal breathing. There mm-hmm. is optimal um, exchange at the cellular level right. when we're when we're breathing properly. Right. Right. Do you talk about that at all with? Or is that getting too much in the weeds? Yeah. No, let's do it. So okay. in the end, what we want to do is encourage the the most efficient, most effective way of transferring oxygen to our cells. And so let's get into the weeds here for science. So there's something <laughs> called the Bohr effect, mm-hmm. right? It's the disassociation, disassociation of oxygen from our hemoglobin to allow that exchange with their muscle cells to take CO2 away. Now, if, and I'm a science teacher, by the way. Yeah. So for people who are listening, he's not just making up stuff. There really is a bore yeah. effect. Yeah. And uh, like, yeah. So he's he's spot on on his science from Newton <laughs> to Bohr. Just so you know. <laughs> and and some background too, biology too in college. So we're on okay. the same page. <laughs> yeah, we're on the same page. So. But yeah, uh, the better we can use that effect or allow that effect to truly happen, as it should, then um, yeah, the results we want are there. If so, teaching someone how to breathe slow and um, not labored mm-hmm. is the key first. So teach them in, in that specific constrained environment of 
okay, whatever, whatever that skills you're trying to teach them, that deadlift or that push up or that run, is allowing them in the, that calm to execute that or that focus so that the breathing pattern is not an issue. And then when we start to progress them, is this monitor their change in physiology. If it starts getting too complicated for them, because they're trying to focus on all the things and coordinate all the things at once, then what happens to the heart rate and focus? Starts to kind of get out of whack a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that's what threshold training is, right? We pull them back, drill, 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 put them in that, that constrained environment or that scenario again, and then see if you can execute correctly and not have that physiology raise as much, um, just like compared to last time. So what we're trying to do then, at the very scientific level, we're just applying the scientific method to whatever yeah. they're doing. We observe, we measure, tests or to validate validate that hypothesis we, we have created right for that specific uh stimulus right trying to apply to them okay going back up so the breathing <laughs> thing again so we can say okay so for this specific 100 meter run maintain a pace where you can only breathe your nose right and then from there okay well, however the time was let's see if we can beat it next time while still maintaining those breathing and Maybe pull back as soon as you start to feel like you need to breathe out of your mouth. And then from there, another iteration is, oh, let's, learn, let's run 200 meters next week and see if you can sustain the whole thing with your nose. But then in that process, okay, getting an education on what, why they're doing what they're doing with the nose. Okay, let's improve CO2 tolerance that way. Let's uh, allow that bore effect to happen more effectively that way. And we're getting that nitric oxide release that yes. dilates blood vessels and like... I mean, there's so much science behind it. It's yes. like a huge, like we could probably do a separate like podcast this, yeah. on just that. Yeah. Um, but uh, they do feel the effects. Yes, immediately. It. Yeah. I, I, I have kids that I've had for four years and you see them nasal breathing during a tough Metcon and mm -hmm. they're able to maintain performance. Yes. That's focus. Over time. Focus yeah. most importantly. Yeah. And, and I just think that that's huge if we're trying to get them to think about what they're doing. I mean, we don't want, especially our boys that don't have a fully developed prefrontal cortex anyway, to shut off what little brain power they have <laughs> at that point. So, yeah, that's huge. Therein lies the importance of really reinforcing technique then. Yeah. Right? Make it so rote or automatic for them in training that they can revert or fall back to that level of training, right? when their prefrontal cortex goes away. <laughs> when they start going flight freeze or right. pure, pure sympathetic, can they still do post wall pull, for example, uh, at the highest levels possible in that moment? Hmm. I might have some more answers um, <laughs> in the near future because I'm, I'm looking at, like, how do you recenter that athlete? You know, mm -hmm. breathing is one. Mm -hmm. um, the conversation that they're having mm -hmm. with themselves, right? Um, right. Yeah. The, the the internal conversation, whether that's you know positive self talk or whether that's uh, you know I can't do this or this isn't working or yeah. you know the negative messages. Do you, do you talk about that when people are? I mean, as, as I would imagine as a cross country coach. Yeah. Which you know I hate running long long distances, <laughs> but yes. like. They're probably having lots of conversations in of their course. head. For, for three miles, they're probably talking to themselves a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, do you talk about breathing? Do you talk about mm -hmm. the dialogue that's going on in, yeah. in between the ears? So zooming out, broad perspective of what we as teachers and coaches are, I think what I've seen, what I can distill it down to now is us, we as teachers and coaches, are all trying to get that person we're trying to help to focus in the moment. Focus in the moment on the technique, the standard of what they should be executing in that specific split second, that mm -hmm. moment. And if it pertains to running then, it's that specific cue of changing support. And that simple cue of pull to break contact with the ground is the only thing they really shouldn't be working on or focused on. If they allow that gravity to pull them to free fall forward, if they're running forward, and all they got to do in response is, is to break contact by pulling it foot off the ground, that simplifies it completely. Mm -hmm. So when someone's running a cross-country race, 3.1 miles, gun goes off, immediately start falling. They need to think, literally say to themselves, pull, 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 the whole way through. And that 
in terms of um, mental toughness, that's the highest mental toughness you can possibly exhibit if you're just focused on one thing and one thing only. Mm. And by applying that in whatever sp- other sport they're playing or doing, that changes the game. Yeah. I like that. I heard the acronym because um, we want to win. Mm-hmm. but And so we focus on what's important now. Ooh. And I don't know who said that. I probably should give them credit, <laughs> but they probably stole it too. Yeah. Um, but that sounds like what you're talking about. It's like in this moment, what's most important? And then... You know, train them to know what what to do in that moment and fall back on and simplify. Yes. Right? What, what, what is that most important? What's that most important action they should be taking in that moment Right. for the result they want? Right. Hmm. Mm-hmm. That's good. Um, I don't know. Is there anything else you want to talk about? I, I don't know how much time we have here. Um, any other areas you want to dig into a little bit actually yeah let's highlight what we're doing with these uh, local military and law enforcement guys yeah so i've been asked by dr roman to join him on the road okay to go to different army posts to teach soldiers how to run i saw some of the videos Looked you did pretty cool yeah. yeah problem is it was identified uh i think before right before 2020 that it was uh, $557 million every year that just the Army is paying for a medical cost dealing with lower limb MSK injuries. <laughs> These are mostly soft tissue injuries. Maybe some shin splints and stress fractures that are lumped in, right? That is also re- uh, resulting in 8.8 million lost duty days per year that these, uh, specifically Army soldiers, cannot do their job because they're put on medical profile. And... In the event that they should be called to deploy and fight for us, they can't. So uh, as, was, as it was identified that, I think it was like 13 brigade combat teams cannot deploy every year. Wow. That's how many thousands of soldiers. Now, with that problem defined, then the solution has been that in 2020, Army put in pose method as their method of instruction of running skill to those soldiers. So there's something called the Holistic Health and Fitness Field Manual. This is uh, 7-22. And specifically in that manual of chapter 7, it's literally called running skill. Hmm. So they give a little, a uh, few paragraphs on what the theory is, what the background of what pose method is, and then drills and exercises to follow, to do. So now soldiers can refer to that field manual. If they need to improve their two-mile run, for example, as part, as part of their ACFT, their Army Combat Fitness Test, they can look at those series of drills and exercises and be able to practice of themselves and execute on their runs. Now, the value of that is that someone else can now instruct that. Someone else can follow that and then help someone else in the Army. If we're talking about elementary school kids and running all this in sports just now, we can do the same with our soldiers then. When they first enter basic training, then their drill sergeant should know those drills and exercises to teach these soldiers how to run now, right, right off the bat. Hmm. When we go to these, uh, these courses at these posts, we ask everyone in attendance, all right, raise your hand. Who told you, who taught you how to march? They would say. Drill sergeant. Yep. yep. And then we asked them, so who taught you how to uh, fire a weapon? Drill sergeant. But then we also asked hmm. them, who taught you how to run? Nobody. No answer. <laughs> or the drill sergeant told them to... Go run. Yeah. What we've done is change the paradigm what they think of what running is now in the Army itself. That is a running skill first before any kind of running cardio training. That uh, Then that is going to significantly reduce their amount of uh, non-contact or lower limb MSK injuries and further reduce the cost of that, further reduce their, um, uh, improve their force readiness. Right. And so with that model of working with the active duty, as me being an assistant with that, I've taken that model and applied it here locally. So I've reached out to the Idaho Army National Guard here at Gowan, as well as the Air National Guard, uh, working with them a little bit, trying to emphasize to them that this is available and this resource is available to them in the whole Army itself, like in the field manual and all that. And me as a local resource for them too, to go to them 
to show them what these drills actually are and how, how they're supposed to be executed, what the intent of those are, to give them all that knowledge and to help each other out. And from there, I've also taken that and applied it to the local Ada County Sheriff's Training Center and helped them out a little bit. Got some good results of that. I have some, I have some uh, actionable and uh, sellable data now from that. Yeah. And from there, I have, I have a couple footholds and a couple other fire departments around to really get them into the into the know, essentially, yeah. to improve their performances. The the world we're operating as civilians, essentially, is a voluntary world of running. So we choose to go out and do a 5K at some point, or we train for a half marathon, whatever. Now, these people in those worlds, it's a mandatory thing for them to run. Right. Yet we're seeing this, still the same injury rates. So it all, the root cause is just, again, it's the concept of what the how to do is, what the technique of it is. So if you can... Give them what the standard is, what technique is. We can start to see both worlds, the voluntary and mandatory world of running uh, experiences grow or get better. And like I said at the very beginning, when I came up here, uh, one specific mission I've had is to elevate the culture of what running here is in this state. And if we could look at it at this way now as a higher standard, higher skill um, from a higher perspective, then we can start to elevate the, the culture of it, that everyone around, all the high schools around, can start using as to teach their kids, to train their kids this way. And we can truly see performance improve. The, all they're trying to do now is, okay, beat me at post wall pull. Beat me at trying to uh, improve my perception of falling and pulling. Mm -hmm. And we'll see what the results are like. And that's what the ultimate chase should be like. Yeah, I like that. I, you you answered my next question because you talked about the military, but you know, I have a lot of friends that are, first responders and, and I think you know some of them mm -hmm. um, and I know that like their mission at least you know as as CrossFit coaches who are also mm -hmm. firefighters mm -hmm. and, and things like that is to um, raise that standard for even these first responders you know mm -hmm. because they they're constantly in you know life or death situations and need to know you know how to manage the the things we talked about their heart rate and breathing and things like that so mm -hmm. i think that the opportunities seem pretty pretty limitless you know from school age kids to first responders to military um yeah yeah or just like you said just your average runner right that just doesn't want to get hurt you know so i would say with that then is when we are Helping people as far as the CrossFit world goes, right? It just goes down to the very beginning when we took a level one. Is that we're preparing people to handle the unknown and unknowable. Mm -hmm. And as regular people in the street or first responders and military guys, we're all imposed, imposed with the same demands, um, physical demands, really. Yeah. Just and at different levels, but yeah, different levels, ultimately yeah. the different same. Different magnitudes, right? Right, yeah. So in terms of those guys who really need to go on and look for people, help people and fight potentially, right? Then their ultimate level of skill needs to be at the highest levels, right? For the results, for life lost or gained, essentially. Life, life lost or saved. That they really need to really emphasize this and learn this well. Um, yeah, for the, for the job or role they're in, I think. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I, I know with my kids, I mean, they... They remember the things that you taught them. They talk about it. That's great. Um, so, you know, I would definitely encourage, you know, people who are listening to reach out to you and, and whether they're a sports coach or, you know, physical education teacher or, you know, anybody who just wants to bring in an outside just speaker. You know, I know you talk to my health class too. Yeah. And um, I I know as a, as a teacher, it's nice to bring in somebody from the outside to just you know, they get tired of listening to you all the time. And right. I mean, me as a teacher. So right. I think that that's great. Um, anything else? Like, I think well, that's yeah. it. <laughs> so you're going for your level four? Or level, level four. Potentially at some point. Yeah, at some point. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's let this uh, gym remodel. There you go. Kind of let the dust I'm sitting on it. my level three for a while. That was, yeah. That was rugged enough as it was. So I think I'm going <laughs> to. I'm, I'm going to just keep renewing that for a little bit. But. Yeah, I, 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 I renewed myself this year, actually. So oh, did you? I got it in 2020, and it's every three years, right? Yeah, I'm close. I, I took a three-credit class from 
Drake University this summer mm-hmm. on actually on basketball coaching and and sent it to CrossFit and nice. they gave me thirty CEUs for it because it was three graduate credits. So I'm I think I'm about five away at this point. So I'm not too too far. I thought it was like twenty six. Was it twenty six units or something? Or I think it's up to thirty something. Now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so. Congrats. I think it's 36, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so. Awesome. Always learning. Always. We always have to keep learning. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks well, for this. Yeah, thank you. Thanks Appreciate for, it. I, I didn't need all my questions. I think, though, we, I'm looking down at them. I think we actually covered most of this just, Off the just talking. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> when great minds think alike, right? Yes. I got to go get my beard shaped up now. <laughs> Shout out to the beardsmith because... Uh, they're going to take me from Ewok back to, uh, you know, some some sort of shape. Have you ever seen the scene from uh, Karate Kid where they they look at the tree and he's doing the bonsai trees and he's, you know, I've, I feel like that's what they're doing with my beard. Just, Trim it back from, just, from caveman to modern man. <laughs> close, yeah. Close. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for uh, listening and riffing with us riffing with us for a little bit and um till next time i'm albert Liu. thanks to jason george for hanging in with me and see you next time